Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 88th edition of Paula Studio Law. And I'm so delighted to welcome a painter, a contemporary painter uh, in the studio. This is a, the second time I had the pleasure to have Daniel Graves in the studio last year. But this uh, today, on this occasion, we have Nick Todd Hunter, an international, very well known portrait painter coming in. Nick, welcome to the studio. Hello. Thank you, Paolo. It's an absolute privilege and a pleasure to be here. How are you today? Yeah, doing very well. Um, I'm just at my uh, home in uh, England. And uh, as you can see, some of my uh, art collection on the wall behind me, just at my dining room table. Yes. Nick, if you had to introduce yourself to a, a new audience, uh, can you tell us a little bit about you in a few words? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm a for, for, first and foremost, I'm an artist. Um, I'm a classically play, a classically trained portrait painter um, that is trained in Florence. I'm an art historian and I run the um, successful inter Instagram page, um, Portrait Paintings Daily, um, which is sort of uh, the, the most followed Instagram page for portraits and uh, art history on, on portraiture. And Nick, how did you, um, when, first of all, when did you decide that you will be, uh, that you will become a portrait painter? Well, I've always just loved art. I've always painted and I've always uh, drawn. And uh, when I had the opportunity, the first opportunity I could, I went to art school in England, went to Chelsea School of Art and was very disillusioned by the, um, the, the sort of uh, the British tradition and uh, not the British tradition, but the academic tradition, the, the, the contemporary academic tradition in, in England is quite disappointing. There's no classical training. There's no classical training when it comes to drawing or painting. And I thought I was going to be taught by sort of a Lucian Freud, Freud type figure that was going to teach me how to paint classically. And there was none of that. It was much more on the sort of um, uh, sort of installation work. And um, I mean, I remember the first day I was there, they made me put a collage together and I wanted to learn how to paint like Rembrandt. And so I could see that that wasn't gonna happen. So I went and um, uh, I left that Chelsea School of Art and I went and found uh, where the capital of classical training was in the world for portraiture and for painting and it is it's Florence and um, so I went and trained in Florence for three years um, and they they for the first year you don't even paint you just draw um, in pencil and in charcoal and you train your eye to look at um, uh, nature and humans and the human form um, like old masters would have um, and there's a very rigorous training where there's a year of drawing and then you can pick up a paintbrush in your second year. And so that was a fantastic opportunity for me and something that I'd always dreamed of. And it really changed my life for the better. Yes, yes. Uh, we will get into that, you know, the um, what these incredible painters, uh, what they offered, what they left to us. But your Instagram page, Nick, I know you have more than 150,000 people who follow this page on Instagram. How did that start? And how in the world do you find these incredible portraits of artists? I'm surprised every day when I open my Instagram page, I'm thinking, wow, how do you go about looking for uh, artists to feature on the page? It's just whatever captures my eye, really. It started in lockdown, you know, <clears throat> lockdown, everyone was stuck at home. I had a, a library of thousands and thousands of images of paintings that I'd collected from all around the world on my travels. I traveled in the footpath of, um, uh, on the trail of uh, Caravaggio. I I'd been around uh, Holland looking at all the Rembrandt paintings, Titian, I've been to Spain where most of his paintings hang and, and all around Italy to look at his paintings. And I just thought, you know, I'm gonna do something with these images. I'm gonna, I'm gonna post them and I'm gonna start posting them. And yeah, maybe I'll get a couple of thousand followers. Um, well, it took off in lockdown and, uh, you know, here I am four years later or whatever we are, and um, it's become quite popular and quite successful. <laughs> Amazing. I, I do have a link at the end of the talk on how people can find you on Instagram if they're not following you already. Uh, so tonight we will be, today, depending on where you are in the world, we will be looking at three artists. We'll be looking at Titian, Caravaggio, and Rembrandt. And as we were preparing this event, I was thinking just how much these artists, each one of them is a giant in its own right. 
Um, so how about we just dive right in? Sure. Sounds great. My okay. favorite artists in the world. When Paula said, what would you like to talk about? I said, well, could we talk about my three favorite artists, Titian, Caravaggio and Rembrandt? And she said, sure. So here we are. Um, and um, yeah, I suppose let's go to the, the we'll go to the first slide, Paula, and um, look at the um, my favorite um, self-portrait of uh, Titian. That was his last self-portrait that he painted. Um, very late on in his life, he's an old man here, um, and uh, you know he really is the he, he's the king. He's the king of painting. He did everything in his lifetime, and all painters after that came after him absolutely worshipped him. I mean, Anthony Van Dyck when he visited um, Venice, he has a sketchbook that he took with him of Venice, and he just copied Titian paintings over and over again. And he's got sketchbook full sketchbooks full of Titian paintings that he sketched and then he copied the uh, compositions in his paintings um you know it was all it was all taken from Titian and uh, uh if you go to the next slide I had the opportunity in 2016 to paint a commission in Titian's house which is still there um and the owners of the house commissioned me to paint uh, the husband um a gentleman called Claude who's a French uh, man married to an English lady they, they live in this house um and they said well, we'd like to commission you to paint uh, my husband uh, the, the other thing is uh, we live in Titian's house and I, I couldn't quite believe my ears when they told me that so I said you know we ha I have to go and paint it you know don't come to my studio I'll, I'll go I'll go and paint it in your place and this is the house this is actually the room that I painted uh, Claude in um, and uh, no one really knows what what how the house would have been set up I mean there are quite a lot of writings of um uh, there's quite a bit, a bit written about Titian. He was very famous in his lifetime. Um, I mean, we know that his studio, if you go back a slide, um, yeah, that, so his studio is there, on, on sort of where the windows are. Um, and uh, that, that was his studio and that was in the garden. And so he'd walk through his garden to get to his big studio um, where he did, you know, many, many of his masterpieces. Okay, if you go forward a slide. And um, these are the rooms now. We don't know what the rooms would have been like then, but we do know that he died there of um, of the plague. He died in his house, and his last uh, months were 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 chaos. And he was uh, known to be living there by himself. Um, I mean, the law at the time was that uh, you had to isolate for forty days and forty nights um, if you had the plague um, before you could come out. Uh, he didn't make it he died um and the plague was ravaging um was rag ravaging venice uh, at the time uh, there are churches built in venice uh, to to commemorate the plague victims um it was a, a devastation on venice and titian was one of the victims um and that's how he 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 died um unfortunately the, did, his greatest, die uh, in it? did his son die in it did his son die in it as well one of his, yeah, his son his son, his son also died in it, um, and uh, he had two sons. And uh, his son that wanted to be an artist and was very loyal helped him in the studio. He died. Uh, the other son that was um, a priest, uh, and uh, he, he survived them. Um, and no one really knows what happened to him. But the house was looted afterwards. Uh, at the time, the people that um, the only people that could go into the plague victims' houses was a certain group of people. Um, that were very, very corrupt at the time. And they would basically tip off looters as to where valuables were in plague victims' house. And they would just go in and take everything. And so Titian's house was looted and uh, many of his works were looted. Um, so, yeah, the, the amount of Titian paintings that have been lost, uh, who can say, but many. Anyway, let's go forward. Um, and this is just an example of uh, of of, of Titian's, uh, Titian's portraits. I mean, we have to say that Titian, you know, he came to Venice. He was from the mountains in in the Veneto. He wasn't uh, born in the on the island of, of Venice. Um, he came there when he was very young. Um, his uh, family came from. Uh, they produced all the wood. Wood was very important for Venice. Um, the foundations of Venice are built on wood that is basically petrified in the mud underneath Venice. And so there was huge quantities of wood that was needed from the mountains in the Veneto. And uh, that's Titian's family, his uh, parents and his um, family network were wood merchants. 
Um, and so he had links to Venice very early on. He was a uh, he showed um, a talent early on for uh, drawing and painting, and so he was sent to to Venice and uh, eventually found himself in the studio of Giorgione. Um, so we have to say that you know he arrived in Venice at uh, sort of an artistic when it was just coming into its sort of golden age. Um, he was also taught by Giorgione, who was one of the greatest early Venetian painters, um, and so. Yeah, what I want to stress really is that people think that it's sort of these singular geniuses that uh, just take the world by storm and no one knows where their talent comes from. I, I don't believe in that. I believe that people are born into a certain time and a place and uh, and they see an opportunity or they their talents just rise during that time. And certainly Titian is, a, you know, the I think, you know, the, the top five greatest paint, painters of all time. But he was also born in a certain time. He was... Uh, born in, in the golden age of painting in Venice, where um, patrons were very uh, free about what artists' uh, output was. They they gave a lot of artistic license to artists at the time. Um, and he became very famous for his portraiture. Uh, initially, he would, um, he would show uh, patrons in very dignified ways, possibly I mean, you know, here, this is someone that's obviously fought in, fought in a war. He's some sort of soldier uh, and it's very beautifully painted armor. But, um, you know, he would he would do very subtle uh, portraits of incredibly wealthy people. These were Venetians at the time in the 16th century. It was the wealthiest city in Europe. These were the wealthiest people in Europe. Um, and he would paint them in very subdued, subtle, refined ways, not showing, you know, um, outrageous wealth but just showing them holding a book um signifying that they were educated or, or or just very subtle ways of showing them that very much appealed to the population of venice let's go forward a uh, slide yeah you can just see the details um that he's just you know incredibly incredibly refined painter if you go forward Another example, you can see here that uh, incredible um, in details in the in the fabric, um, which as a as an artist, I can tell you it's incredibly difficult to paint fabric like that. Um, and just very beautiful, uh, you know, beautiful pose. You know, these poses that he was starting to invent um, of uh, the sitter sitting slightly, if you see slightly to the side, not front on. Um, slightly to head turned. Um, they're still used in photography today. Um, you know, if you look at magazines, Vogue or Tatler or whatever, th these poses are still still used today. These classical poses are are still the most complimentary poses. And uh, you know, Titian was really the person that started to put these kind of compositions together. Um, go to the next one. I just wanted to say, Nick, about this one. I actually met a restorer who cleaned her. She's in the Pitti Palace, which is now part of the Uffizi Galleries. And um, the restorer was telling me this mesmerizing gaze of this young woman who might have been also the uh, portrait po um, a model for the painting we will also see afterwards. Uh, but she said that her gaze just follows her around the room. So she yeah. said spending the time with this work for her was almost like this meditation. Uh, she spent months and months uh, cleaning it. This is actually the photograph after the restoration. So we really see it in all of its splendor. Yeah, that is um, uh, can we talk interesting. About, can we well. talk about her hair a bit? The Titian's blonde, right? Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Yeah, absolutely gorgeous. I mean, this painting is exquisite. He, he, there's also the beauty of living with a painting. You know, when you go to a museum, it's wonderful to see these these works of art. Um, but it is also just so fleeting. You can't sit there. You can't really take it in. If if you have one of these masterpieces on your wall at home, you do create a real intimate relationship with these works of art. Um, and certainly, that's why I like to have work, works of art around all around in my house. It's uh, it it sort of gives you dopamine in the morning. You look at your paintings you have this relationship with them they live with you throughout your life it's it's a wonderful relationship to have this relationship to art it's a very human instinct i think um you know we are the sort of uh, the, the the creative species the humans we create art uh, no other species does like we do uh, let's let's keep going all right 
this might be the same model. What do you think? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. He would have had uh, he would have had plenty of models coming coming through his studio. Um, you know, a lot a lot of these women were prostitutes. Um, they were free for hire, and uh, there's a lot of speculation. You know, what kind of life did uh, did Titian have? He was uh, certainly lived a a big a big life. He was a character in Venice. He had dinner parties at his house. Those are documented. Uh, he had bands that would play in his garden. He would have um, outdoor um, you know, outdoor dinners and things like that that were documented. They were written about by his best friend Aretino, who was um, an exile to um, Venice from Rome, um, and he was a very famous writer. He was uh, ha had a huge personality, and um, you know he was paid by cardinals and people like that to to not write about them because he would made his name by writing funny poems that would make fun of cardinals and popes and all kinds of things. And he would plaster them up in Rome and uh, make a mockery of these famous people. And uh, they would pay him off to not write about him or even they would pay him to write, you know, nice things about them. He was a very famous writer. Um, there's actually, I think the next slide is the portrait of Aretino, who was his best friend. Yes, yes. Yeah, this is, this is Pietro Aretino. He's from Arezzo in Tuscany. He then went to Rome and he was basically chased out of Rome for writing this uh, controversial, uh, these controversial things. And he was a great friend of Titian. They were best friends. He was uh, godfather to Titian's son, who was the, the priest. Um, and they, Titian and his son fell out. And uh, uh, Aretino was the sort of go-between between between them talking about you know, what would be left in the will and um, little details that were needed throughout his life. You know, back then, <clears throat> Titian liked to surround himself by, you know, close, intimate family and friends that would conduct his business. Um, and uh, Aretino was, he acted as a sort of agent. He would um, uh, hobnob with, uh, you know, sort of the rich and famous in Venice at the time and and uh, always mention, you know, Titian, you need to have a portrait by Titian on your wall because, or a painting by Titian on your wall because, you know, he's the greatest art artist of his age. Um, and so they had a very close relationship and, you um, he he documented dinner parties at Titian's and and also Titian coming over to uh to 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 hit his house on the Grand Canal um and they would uh, drink together and they would uh, go around uh, Venice together and they had a very a famous friendship. Yes, you know the, in this case um, Titian is already losing his sight a bit, right? If you compare this one, to... I don't think here. I don't Not think yet. here. No, but okay. late later in his career he. He was losing his eyesight. That was well documented. And um, he didn't stop painting. <clears throat> he carried on painting even when he was losing his eyesight. And if you look at Titian's later work, I think we have examples later. Um, he his, um, his, uh, they're, they're very um, uh, they're very unrefined paintings. They're, they are very um, sort of uh, soft and not in focus because obviously his uh, eyesight was going but they're also very rigorous painting sort of very bold brush marks and um, there's a painting which i've just looked at in the national gallery in london called the death of um uh, action um where you can sort of see brush marks he stabbed his brush into the painting and um you can see dr paint dripping down the canvas and things like that so you know this, this is um a man that painted every single day of his life, or most days of his life, and even when he was losing his eyesight, he he didn't stop painting. It was uh, something that was just it was his life, so he he carried on going. And uh, I think his later later paintings are fascinating paintings to look at. Um, yes. this is a this is a portrait of uh, King Charles of Spain, who um, who was a great collector of of Titian. Um, he had territories in uh, in in Germany and um, uh, just you know uh, just north of the Veneto, and um, he started collecting Titian's uh, work. And if you want to go and see the best Titian paintings in the world, you don't go to Venice to see them. You have to go to Spain to see them. Um, and the Spanish the Spanish Royal Art Collection is really uh, started by Titian. I mean, he set the tone. Um, uh, you know, we think of Velázquez, we think of Rubens, we think of all these great paintings that are in the, the Prado, which is basically the Spanish royal collection. And Titian was the one that started that. It was King Charles, who's uh, pictured here on his horse, um, that started collecting Titian's work. And they had a 40-year 
relationship um, that was very fascinating, uh, where basically Titian would write letters to him, which you can read and you can find if you're so interested. Go online and try and find the, the letters uh, from Titian to uh, King Charles. But basically, Titian would constantly be asking for money. And um, King Charles uh, of Spain never really paid him properly. And uh, Titian would then send him another painting and then ask for something. And something would be sent, but it wouldn't be the full amount. And so it's this ongoing um, letters to, between them <laughs> where Titian was basically asking to be paid. And uh, King Charles would sort of send him the tax rights for rice in the Veneto and things like that, you know, as payment. And Titian didn't really know what to do with, with those things. Um, but he would obviously... He didn't want to stop painting for the king of spain so he carried on painting um and so they have a huge collection but it's just funny the correspondence at the time you know it's basically titian asking can you pay me um thank you very much for your offer and tax of tax the rights for the tax for rice but you know i just need cash right now um yeah. fascinating letters uh anyway here is a, a very early portrayal of um, a king on a horse and one of the first um paintings of a king and a horse and you can see that the movement it's an incredible painting to see it doesn't do it justice in this slide uh, it's in the prado it's absolutely incredible i stared at that for a good hour when i when i was there um it just really shows the sort of incredible handling of paint that titian had in every category if you have a look at the surface there you have the skin of the horse the hair of the horse you have the velvet on the horse you have the shiny metal um you have the the the, the, the shiny metal the skin of uh, the king in the face the, the 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 natural um trees in the background the sort of all these different vibrations of texture and tone and he's got them perfectly um, you know, it, it just in synchro, you know, it's just synchronized perfectly in this painting. And it's a huge painting. It's about about three meters by four meters, something like that. It's uh, it's a huge piece of work. Um yeah, Nick, let's also, go to the next it, one because the the background looks really amazing. It reminds me so much of Giorgione. Well, yeah, he was very influenced, of course, by Giorgione and uh, Titian, uh, obviously took uh, what Giorgione taught him to new heights um, because yeah. there's, I mean, there's so little known about Giorgione and there's so little pay there's so few paintings by Giorgione but yeah I mean certainly Giorgione set a set a precedent for what Venetian painting would become but Titian took it to heights that had never been seen uh, you know since yeah. it's uh, you know he really was the king of painters um, yeah if we go to the next slide concerned about time these are the poets there and these were painted for the um for for, for king philip of spain who was uh king charles the fifth uh, son who um took over you know carried on being a, a a buyer of titian's work and um titian painted these uh poets as um for a hunting lodge um that uh, philip um of spain had um, that he wanted decorated and he really gave free reign to um to titian to paint what he wanted to do and they um they are um sort of uh, po poetry and paint that's what poesy is meant to mean it's meant to mean poetry and paint um and you know there's a quote that i read the other day uh, that francis bacon said that you know the spirit the the, the the spirituality of an artist can be seen in his um in his uh in his brush work and his when he touches the canvas with paint you can see the spirituality of the artist i don't think there's any other artist that you can see his spirituality so much as titian when you go and closely look at these these paintings in whichever museum you can go and look at them in i mean there's two in the national gallery in london the two central ones that you can see the spirituality of titian the the spirit of the artist lives on he's there in the paintings it's uh you can see when you look at the way the skin tones are painted, you can see the edges of the figures, um, the way he's worked them, the way he's played with paint. It's uh, They're just marvels. They're some of the finest paintings ever painted. Um, and they were uh, and they were painted for uh, for uh, King Philip of, of, of Spain, the King of Spain. You know, um, I'm going to just go back very quickly. Um... In this case, uh, the restorers in Uffizi told me that in many centuries, when they would, of course, restore these works, the rules of restoration were very different than what we have today. And in this case, Vidas Urbina, they actually ironed her at the end with a warm iron to mm. lose, to kind of even out the, you know, Titian's brushstroke. Can you imagine 
losing that essential part of what Titian uh, is all about. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of um, controversy. I mean, you can dive deep. This is why I love the history of art. It's, you can dive, keep diving and diving and diving. There's a lot of sort of um, you know some of the art historians really question. You know, uh, how many assistants did Titian have? He was uh, known to be a, a control freak, and he liked to take you know full control of his paintings. So, you know, which areas of the painting were Titian's, which weren't? How many assistants did he have? It's interesting that you know none of the uh, people that worked in his studio became famous um, artists afterwards. You know he probably guarded his secret ways. I mean there is an argument that Tintoretto uh, was expelled from his studio early on, but no one really knows if Tintoretto was uh, one of his assistants early on in his career or not. Um, but uh, yeah, T Tintoretto famously famously had on his studio door. Um, drawing like Michelangelo and colour like Titian um, as a sort of advertising sign on his uh, studio door. So who and knows? Yet... I mean, it, it, we don't have time to go into it all now, but you can. this is why I love art history. You can just dive deeper and deeper and deeper into these artists' lives, and it's, it's really yeah. fascinating. First and foremost, you know, the, these people were people. They were human beings trying to make money, trying to... It was essentially a trade back then. Um, you know, you were a painter back then, you were um, like a cobbler. You were making, you know, you were making something for a clientele and you were paid a certain amount of money and you had to train in a certain way to achieve these things. Um, you know, it, it was very much a trade. Uh, you know, artists today uh, are seen as these sort of um, you know, people that live outside the, you know, outside the, the law of human law and, you know, people like Picasso that were just geniuses and everything they touched turned to money and things like that. Yeah, it was very different back then. It, they were really um, tradespeople and they uh, worked in their studios and they produced, uh, you know, they produced these works of art for their clientele. Anyway, let's uh, let's keep going. This uh, painting was um, painted for his um, tomb, uh, which was agreed that he would be uh, buried in the friary because the friary has his um, very, very famous uh, assumption uh, uh, painting. Um, which is uh, really made his name and create you know created his great fame in Venice as the greatest painter that, that Venice had ever produced and it's still there in Venice in situ has has not has not m moved it's it's still there because of this he's buried in the friary and this was the painting that was going to be on his tomb um, it was um, unfinished at his death obviously he died of the plague and he died quickly of the plague and so he wasn't able to finish this um they think he died when he was a, about in his 80s even though he in his letters to king philip of spain he said he was 102 um i think he wanted to stress that he was becoming very old and he needed pain quite quickly but anyway this was found in his studio and it was uh, actually finished later by one of his assistants um and you can see at the bottom there there's some writing which basically stresses that this is a painting by Titian, but it is finished by one of his assistants. Um, and it's his final, it's his final painting. And you can see, as we were talking before, he was getting quite, uh, you know, bad eyesight. And you can see how blurry everything is compared to his early work. You can see how soft of focus everything is. Um, and also the brushwork is much thicker and rigorous. It's not as refined. He's stabbing areas of the... Uh, of the canvas with his with his you know with a loaded brush loaded with paint and just really creating bold marks and brushwork um because he just firstly he, later on in his career i don't think he had the patience to have to produce such refined painting but also his eyesight was going and so he had to sort of make more vigorous work to see what he was doing so um that's the final painting of titian Nick, some of the people, uh, some of the students said that he actually would paint with his fingers, just dabbing the fingers in the paint and going with it on the canvas directly. Absolutely. But that wasn't uncommon. I mean, that's I do that as well. Um, you can really um, paint quite effectively with your with your you can soften edges with your finger. And um, there's all kinds of things that are very useful to do with your fingers. So it's not uncommon, but you can see that in certain um canvases when you look up closely you can see you know finger marks and things like that and um 
even where he's cleaned the brush and things like that, just on the side, under under areas of the painting, and, and uh, it's really, you know, you really see that's that's the spirituality of the of the artist. The, this man was alive once, creating these great great paintings, and you can see these little details vibrating all over these canvases, and it's they're just. Uh, pieces very dear to my heart pieces that you can always go back to and look at year after year after year after year and they'll be there long after we're gone so they're really um wonderful things that humanity's created and i love the homage to san marco and the, the beautiful golden mosaics of the beloved san marco church in venice right yeah um, well the venetians loved their gold didn't they they were wealthy enough to have lots of it <laughs> yes, yes. Before we move on to the next artist, I just wanted to say, um, if you kind of think of Titian and how much he has produced in his lifetime, I think about just in the case of portraits, he paints about 400 portraits in his lifetime, plus all the other altarpieces and all the other commissions he had. So kind of, what do you think would his daily life would have been? Would he been kind of painting nine to five or would it have been something that he would dedicate even more of his uh, hours in a day? in his studio. No, I think it would have been like a job. I think he would have painted nine to five. He would have woken up probably earlier. I don't think there was a nine to five schedule back then, um, but he would have painted when the daylight was good. Um, and he would have, uh, you know, painted only in, you know, there was no lights back then. He would have painted when th there was good light and uh, and uh, he, his studio was uh, facing north. Um, they say that his studio was facing north because he wanted to see the mountains of, of Veneto where he was from. Um, but he would have uh, essentially, yeah, painted every day. I mean, these paintings don't make themselves. You have to uh, be in your studio doing the work for them to come out. And how many paintings have we lost of Titians? Probably hundreds. Um, who knows? You know, the lootings, the the fires in Venice. Famously, there was, you know, many fires in Venice. And so it's difficult to know. But, um, you know, that that sort of adds to the mystery, doesn't it? If anyone wants to visit his uh, house, of course, it's not open to public, but I love the location. It's actually in the um, Fondamenta Nuove. So he really could go out and just see the Dolomites across and the sky, the beautiful clouds. So every time I pass by, they always think, wow, this is what Titian would have seen, at least the yeah. And it wasn't called the Fondamenta Nuove then. The Fondamenta Nuove was built by Napoleon as because his house would have been right onto the water. So you would have basically been able to get a boat f straight into his house um, at the time. So that extension, the fundamental Nuove that goes all along the north bank of Venice was built much later on. Um, so he would have essentially just had a, a, you know, a beach or a canal right outside of his house um, and uh, probably quite open. They would have probably looked out onto the lagoon. It would have been... What I would give to go back and be, have dinner have dinner with Titian back then. Titian Aratino. In yes. the 16th century in Venice would have been a marvel. <laughs> you know, one of the news from the from Venice is I actually was passing by his house just recently, and the house next door is on sale. So if anyone wants to be Titian's neighbor in this lifetime, <laughs> there is actually opportunity now. Anyway, let's move well, on. I, I wanted to see his studio when I was there, but his studio was rented out by a, basically they just store marble in it. Um you know, I wanted to go into the studio and walk around and have and see, you know, the size, the where would the where was the the light coming in and where would he have set his paintings up? But it was off limits. It was just a, a marble storage, just filled filled with marble. Wow, wow. Anyway, a very different character. Yeah, I chose these three artists because they sort of, as uh, Titian dies, um, Caravaggio is born and. The, the next phase of the art, you know, of art history really is uh, focused on what Caravaggio did. I mean, at the time, people wouldn't have seen it like that. They knew Caravaggio was doing amazing things, but you can't have that macro bird's eye vision on art history at the time and see what's happening. But from now, from a historical point of view, Caravaggio then became the most important thing in the, the history of art. Um, there's a very famous art historian said that there was art before Caravaggio and art after Caravaggio, and they were not the same thing. He really changed everything and uh, had uh, the most biggest odyssey of a life that uh, anyone could ever imagine. It's better than any James Bond story uh, you could ever think of. He was born in Milan um, in a town called Caravaggio, um, and he... Um, 
went down to Rome where everyone went to, um, if you were famous in uh, those days, if you were famous uh, and you wanted to be anyone, it was like nowadays, if you want to make films, where do you go? You go to Hollywood. Uh, then if you wanted to be a famous painter, you went to Rome. There was no other place for it. That was the Hollywood of painting. And that's where you went. And he went there when he was very young. If we go to the next slide. And he sort of cut his teeth as a um, painter of still life. He was from the area of Milan and artists from this area of Italy were famous for still life painting. And that's where he um, started painting still lives. He, 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 as you can see, this painting is incredibly well painted. Um, it's uh, one of the first still life paintings in the history of art. And there's an incredible tension to it. This basket of fruit is sort of overhanging the table, whatever the ledge that it's on. There's a tension there. Some of the leaves are dying. Some of them are rotting in the edge. There's a tension to that. Some of the fruits are old and dying. Some of them um, are withering away. There's a tension to that. If you look at the apple, it's rotting. Uh, so he's painting incredibly beautiful paintings, but he's saying that things die. You know, <laughs> we die. We die. Um, and uh, some of these... Um, this is, for example, um, the boy with the basket of fruit. This is was painted when he was very early on when he arrived in Rome. And uh, these were the sort of paintings he was painted. Obviously, he was known for still life painting. So he he has the still life, this, this boy holding the still life. And he was sort of, this, this painting sort of made his name. Um, and he was brought into um, the house of one of the famous cardinals there, um, who used to apparently eat salad all the time. And, and uh, uh, Caravaggio thought that this man was very odd and he called him Cardinal Salad, um, making fun of him. He obviously had quite a sense of humour, uh, Caravaggio, and was incredibly, uh, an incredibly wild individual. Um, I personally think he was uh, an alcoholic and he would, um, you know, get, get drunk and get into all kinds of, of fights and mischief and things like that. And then when he wasn't drinking, he would be very sensitive, you know, a very sensitive artist type where he would think very you know about the sort of sensitive paintings that he ended up painting and then he would sort of lose the plot and get drunk and because a, a lot of the things that we know about him in Rome are we find in the old court documents he was always in fights um famously he got in a fight for in one of the bars for uh, an argument with the chef uh, about how his artichokes were cooked and he asked the waiter how have, how have you cooked these artichokes uh, and the waiter said, "Why don't you, um, why don't you uh, taste them yourself and see?" And the cook had cooked them in butter, which basically said that you're a northerner, and you're not good enough to have uh, artichokes that are cooked in olive oil like us refined southerners. And he find he found this incredibly offensive, and smashed the plate of artichokes over the cook's head, and was then put in uh, into jail and he had to go to court. And you can read all about this in, in the court documents. And so, yeah, he was always in for brawls in the street and eventually he uh, killed a man in Rome, um, someone that he knew. I mean, for those of you who have been to Florence, you can understand what kind of situation Rome would have been back then. It's sort of like Florence in a way. It would have been a similar sort of size. It was these alleyways and these streets. Everyone would have known each other. I mean, I lived in... Florence for three years and I I sort of knew you know a lot of people in the area that I lived in and I'd walk around chow 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 you know I would know people and you know these you have these these relationships these relationships that were going on in the city at the time and he would have been on the scene Caravaggio would have been a man on the scene known um, an artist a famous artist and uh, he had this ongoing um, sort of feud with this uh uh, this uh, Tomasoni character who was um, uh, for, for quite a famous Roman family in uh, in Rome at the time. And they um, basically had a duel. And uh, in the sword fight, um, Caravaggio stabbed him in the, in the groin um, and he bled to death. Uh, and Caravaggio had to go on the run and uh, he had to leave Rome uh, under the cover of night. He had protection from some of his patrons and they got him to Naples, uh, where he stayed for a number of years and painted. If you go to the next slide. Well, but I think the next slide is actually the calling of Matthew. So 
Yeah, this was painted while he was still in Rome. And uh, as you can see, he's painting a very famous uh, biblical scene, but he's not painting it as uh, characters in the Bible. He's painting characters as they were seen at the time in Rome. I mean, these figures are not painted like, uh, you know, biblical figures from 2000 years ago. They're painted from, you know, 16th century, 17th century characters that would have been living in Rome at the time. And as you can see, um, Matthew is called. He's there sitting at the table. He doesn't look too well. He looks pretty upset. Looks like he's just uh, lost. They're all pointing to him. He's in the far left of the picture. They're all pointing to him. He looks like he's just lost a game of cards. He looks like he's just lost all his money. And um, he looks down in the dumps and in walks uh, Jesus and calls him. And uh, as you can see above the hand that calls him, the window is shaped like a cross um and uh, a holy cross and if you look at the hand the hand looks very much like the hand um of michelangelo in the sistine chapel so he would have um he would have gone into the sistine chapel and used this imagery and uh, put it into his paintings very very effectively and these things would have been picked up by um you know, by by the Romans at the time, who who looked at his paintings and he it was, I mean, these paintings were like looking at the greatest film of, of nowadays that comes out. You know, the it, no one had seen anything like this before. No one had seen these kind of paintings, painting biblical scenes with characters then in in you know, um, painted so really. The, these these aren't um, these are characters that you would find in a in a in a pub at the time in a bar. Um, yeah anyway keep going to the next image i love how one um italian art historian said there is never one michelangelo without the other because of course his name was michelangelo merisi caravaggio right so this sure, hand yeah. is just absolutely incredible yeah incredible and completely taken from michelangelo's sistine chapel just copied so he was influencing artists back then Yeah, the, these are just examples of his work. He was very famous for his light and shadow, which had never been um, seen before in such incredible effectiveness. <clears throat> I mean, the way that he frames people in light had never this had never been painted before like this. Uh, this this light and shadow, this contraposto, it's um, it's uh, revolutionary. Um, you know, to, to, to the history of art. And he was the one that really invented it. And it's incredibly effective. You can see it's still used today in uh, in films, for example. Martin Scorsese was very influenced by Caravaggio's work. If you keep going to the next one. Yeah, you can see here, this is uh, St. Peter being crucified. Very, uh, very um, violent scene. Um, people think that Caravaggio is portraying himself holding the cross in the le on the left-hand side. They think that that is a self-portrait of Caravaggio. He put himself into many of the paintings. Um, and um, he's portraying St. Peter with his, um, showing his uh, the bottom of his feet. And if you look underneath, the person that's holding up the cross has dirt all over his feet. Um, these kind of things had never been seen before. And people... Um, you know, they they really, really engaged with these paintings because they were so real at the time. No one had seen the bottoms of people's feet painted. But of course, peasants back then would have seen the bottoms of their feet all the time and they would have been dirty and they would have related to these paintings. And these were put in churches that were as these pilgrims would have come in to go to St. Peter's Church. They would have stopped in other churches on the way. They would have looked at these paintings and they would have just been in absolute awe. Can you imagine living in a village somewhere in southern Italy, never really seeing paintings and going to Rome and you see this, the scale of these paintings on these huge Baroque churches that are full of gold and just iconography? I mean, it, these, these people must have been in complete awe. They didn't have smartphones. They didn't watch films. They didn't have TV. They had nothing. They couldn't even read the Bible. And they come in here and they heard about these stories from their church and they saw the visualization of them painted in such graphic detail and the dirt on the bottom of these people's feet. This had never been seen before in the history of art. Fascinating. Keep going. Uh, 
And also to think about, you know, his patrons, the, the, it was very specific patrons who would actually be working with Caravaggio because not everyone would be able to even understand where he's going with this, right? Yeah, he, he was famously very rude to his patrons and he sort of treated them like uh, they were imbeciles, even though these were very wealthy car cardinals. He, he sort of thought that he was the man that knew <laughs> no one else could touch him. Um, and uh, he was the man that knew everything. I mean, you can't argue really. He 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 really knew what he was doing visually with uh, some of these compositions. This is this is one of my fa uh, favorite Caravaggio paintings, the Taking of Christ. This was just found in a monastery in Ireland somehow. Um, we can't really go into the, you know the long story of how that happened, but um, it's a fascinating story. If you want to, um, you know, maybe Wikipedia the Taking of Christ uh, after this uh, talk. Um, and read about it, it's, uh, it's really interesting. But if you see the far right-hand side, um, the character that sort of has his eyes in the light, that's uh, Caravaggio there, it's a self-portrait again, um, holding up the lantern, and uh, it's a very okay. refined, yeah, that one there. And it's a very refined um, portrait of, uh, of, uh, of Christ. I think it's very particularly well, well painted. The, th the thing is about um, Caravaggio is, after he went on the run, um, he um, his paintings sort of uh, got worse, especially as he was on the run in Sicily and he was under increasing pressure and uh, he was getting more and more paranoid. I think he was drinking more and more too. Um, and his uh, late paintings are very bad. Um, he, um, yeah, I mean, this is just an example. As I said, again, you can see the bottoms of these people's feet um, and they were just as... You know, these would have been pilgrims and they would have looked exactly like these people here in the paintings. Um, they would have gone to these churches and basically seen themselves on Caravaggio's paintings and they would have really engaged and they, they would have been talked about in the streets and more and more people would have wanted to come and see his paintings. He really was famous at his time. He was known throughout Europe. He was the most famous painter in Rome. He he was the man um, and he destroyed himself. Um yeah, just more um, examples of the kind of cinematic imagery that he created. Um, really powerful, powerful imagery, powerful paintings um, that these slides don't do justice, but it's it's lovely to have uh, the internet as access to just see them. But please go to the Louvre, see this. It uh, goes anywhere to see Caravaggio paintings. They're the most incredibly powerful paintings in the world. Keep going. Yeah, this is an example of his late work. As you can see, it's very, very soft and unfinished um, work. I don't think he finished this painting. Uh, I think that th this painting was painted in Sicily um, after he had escaped um, from Malta, from the Knights of Malta. And he had the Knights of Malta on his tail and also people from Rome on his tail. So he was very, very paranoid at the time, drinking a lot. Um, Apparently, he only had one companion, which was his dog, which was a little black poodle um, who used to walk on two feet. Um, but yeah, uh, fascinating to see. You keep going. This was the uh, very famous painting where he was given protection after he fled from Naples. He fled to Malta, which was under the control of the Knights of Malta, who were above the law. Um, and uh, they um, protected him. And if you became a Knight of Malta, you too were above the law. So he wanted to become a Knight of Malta and he made a deal with the Knights of Malta that if he painted a huge altarpiece for them, that they would cr they would knight him um, and he would then be above the law and he could then return to Rome. Uh, on the night of this painting being unveiled in Malta, he was arrested and put into jail in in Malta, in, um, in in basically a hole in Malta that you can go and see now. Um, and uh, uh, no one really knows why he was, I mean, there are there is speculation why he was arrested and what he was done, uh, but it was probably for fighting of some sort, uh, fighting with another knight, probably quite a powerful knight. Um, and uh, when this was meant to be his greatest day, when he was about to be made a knight of Malta, it was going to be one of the greatest days in his life. He was now you know, free from uh, the, the death, the murder that he had committed in, in Rome. He ruined it all. It was complete sabotage and he was put in jail and uh, he then escaped Malta. He had to escape Malta and he went on the run to Sicily. Um, 
but uh, this was the altarpiece for the Knights of Malta, and it's still there in Malta. I've been to see it. It's a uh, gruesome painting, uh, violent as was his life, um, and uh, and very powerful imagery. Keep going. Well, now we get to Rembrandt, and so as the um, just to sort of cap off uh, Caravaggio, he went on the run from uh, again from Sicily, and uh, he was um, had made made a deal with the Pope to give him a series of paintings, and um, he would then be pardoned. Um, and he was trying to get from Sicily to um, Rome, but he obviously had to get there without being captured before in one of the ports or anywhere else. If he got found by the Knights of Malta or if he got found by the people in uh, Naples that he um, were, were after him, then obviously, you know, he was done for. He had to get to Rome and get to the Pope. Um, and he died of um, basically... Um, of uh, malaria on the um on the tuscan coast um but there's a lot of sort of speculation about that was he murdered did he die of of um of malaria what happened to to to, to caravaggio there's no gravestone no one knows where his body's gone no one knows where the paintings for the pope have gone everything's disappeared so it's sort of an un unanswered question that um is fascinating to read about if you if you have the time and if you're interested in, in Caravaggio there's many many books about him um I would recommend uh, A Life Sacred and Profane by Andrew Graham Dixon who is my hero and I've uh, interviewed him for Portrait Paintings Daily you can have a look at our interview uh, in the video section of Portrait Paintings Daily um it's the this the my in my opinion the best book on Caravaggio um go to the next slide we'll talk about Rembrandt so after yeah after um Caravaggio um, died. We have uh, in uh, in in Holland, in the Low Countries, Rembrandt um, sort of came to life. And uh, what I want to say about Rembrandt is, like Titian, he was born in a very special time in Dutch history. Amsterdam at the time was the most powerful, wealthiest city in the world. You know, these paintings, the you know, the art world is dominated by money it always has been and uh where there's um money there's great art um it's 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 sort of uh, one of the ultimate signifiers of of wealth and taste um uh, to have good artwork we see it today with um you know with coons and hearst and whoever you want to have on your walls nowadays uh there's a lot of money behind all these artists it wasn't any different for the artists of that day where there was a wealthy city, there was great art and great artists flocked there to sell their paintings. And Rembrandt was one of them. He was from Leiden in the north of Holland. And he went down to Amsterdam because it was the wealthiest city in the world. And he was a, a you know, precocious artist that, you know, he wanted to he wanted to make a name for himself. And uh, to Amsterdam, he went. If we go to the next sl slide. What fascinates me about Rembrandt is his early paintings are not very good. This is one of his early works and you can see, look at the hands, they're tiny compared to the faces. Look how badly the faces are painted. I mean, this is Rembrandt we're talking about. How did he go from this to go to the next painting, to something as amazing as that? It's a bit of a mystery. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really, something that I find very hard to understand. Um, but he obviously improved very, very quickly. Um, and uh, this beautiful painting here is uh, in the Getty Museum. Um, and uh, well, it's an incredible piece. The pathos, the psychology of his sitters, very much like Titian. He had this refined way of painting his um, Protestant, uh, uh, you know, Dutch uh, counterparts in this very refined way. They didn't want to be shown with too much bling, too much gold. They were shown in this very refined, sophisticated way, and uh, it really appealed to the senses, not for his whole career, because um, he fell out of fashion later on in his life. But for a period of time, Rembrandt was the most famous artist in Amsterdam. Everyone wanted a portrait by him. He painted the the, the, the rich and the famous of Amsterdam. Um, and this is a very famous uh, painting. Uh, Jacob blessing the son of Joseph. Yeah, he, he was clearly... Um, uh, you know, he was very a pious man, very uh, religious, very 
interested in these biblical stories, painted them with such humanity. And when you see that that you know that the the touch of the girl's head and the look of the father, it's I mean, it's the, the humanity, the psychology of Rembrandt's paintings. I think uh, no artist uh, in, in the history of art has uh, come close to his his sort of uh, compassion of 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 our fellow human uh, like Rembrandt has. Keep going. Uh, this uh, painting here is the conspiracy of uh, uh, the Claudius Civilis, and this was a painting that was he was commissioned to paint in the town hall of Amsterdam, and the painter the the board um, uh, commissioned him to paint it, uh, and it was a huge painting, probably uh, ten meters by eight meters, eight meters by ten meters, something like that, um, and he finished this painting and um put it up in the town hall and the board and the board came to um have a look at the painting and um and they hated it and they did not want to pay him for the painting and he was already running up a big debt he was a famous spender rembrandt and um uh, if you go to his um house in amsterdam now he um he he spent lavishly and uh, he, they didn't pay him for this painting and he went broke. This uh, beautiful, uh, yeah, if you stay on this painting a second, if you go back. Yeah, so this painting was um, was cut down. Um, it was cut down to this size, which is like a tenth of the size of it. Um, and it now, it's now in the National Museum in Stockholm. Um, but this was basically what destroyed his career. He wasn't paid for this. He fell out of fashion. French painting became much more fashionable with frilly dresses and things like that. Not the sort of um, the, the muted colors of um, Rembrandt's early career. Um, and uh, he went broke. Um, he had to sell his house. He had to sell everything. Um, and um, yeah, this was, uh, uh, this was found in his studio when he died um it looks no very unfinished to... nick well it's it's late career rembrandt it's um you know he he sort of had this alchemy for paint he i, I love it i love the way his late career the way he painted but um at the time it was very unfashionable he had such a command of the paintbrush and of paint he could do what he wanted with it and this is what he wanted to communicate he wanted to paint fast he wanted to paint thick he wanted to paint powerful imagery with thick impasto paint with incredible lighting incredible um you know the colors in this painting like you can't it does just doesn't do it justice the yellow it just glows like you're looking at gold it's the one of the most astonishing paintings to see in real life it i spent hours and hours looking at this luckily it was in the Rijksmuseum when i was there in 2000 and uh 16 when i went to the reichs museum it was there i couldn't believe it it was there on the wall opposite opposite um the self portrait of, of him as um of uh, as st paul and uh, i just stared at it for hours it's astonishing it's one of his greatest works and when he presented it to the to the board of the town council in amsterdam they were disgusted they didn't pay for it they took it down and he cut it down to size and it was found in his studio when he died. No one wanted it. Unbelievable. Go to the next uh, piece. This is in the Getty Museum. It's just a, a, an incredible example of the psychology and the compassion for humanity that he had and really does fascinate me. What was going, what kind of person was Rembrandt? Clearly loved people. He was clearly fascinated in people. I think he was quite um, a social person, probably liked to drink, probably frequented many bars when he was uh, when he was living. He, he had um, quite a bulbous red nose when, when, he, was, when he died. Uh, I think he was a big drinker. Um, social guy, loved people. And you can see the alchemy of the paint, what he could do with a paintbrush. It's uh, the, the expression, the way he um, indicates um, the shape and the, of the face and the contours of the face through this thick, quickly painted, wet in wet paint is um, 
an absolute marvel. I, I just think they're the finest portraits ever painted. I could just look at Rembrandt paintings, you know, forever, and I will look at them forever. And, but this also, if you go back a slide, go back one slide. No, go back one slide. I mean, this this is also could be someone. No, go forward. This also could just be someone today. I mean, this this doesn't look like someone in 1661. It, it could be someone today. Um, yeah, very contemporary looking as well. Timeless, timeless works of art. Van Gogh famously said that uh, he, he could look at this one painting, if he could look at one painting for the rest of his life, it would be this one painting. It was Van Gogh's favourite work of art. And you can see the effect that it had on Van Gogh if you look at the um, sleeve of the man touching his bride, uh, you know, thick yellow paint, as Van Gogh was very famous for. Um, beautiful, sensitive, the way the bride touches the groom, the hand, the look, the humanity, just beautiful. Keep going. This was found on Rembrandt's um, easel in his studio when he died. This was the last painting that uh, Rembrandt ever painted. Um, Rembrandt famously um, lost his son, who was uh, very, very close to him. Um, a year before he died and uh it's just a very uh it's very um revealing of what was uh going on in rembrandt's head uh, a picture of uh simeon in, in with the infant christ in the temple um i think he was um heartbroken about his son's death and uh couldn't go on uh, this was the last painting that he that he he painted um incredible keep going we have some of these. We have some of these. I guess he did forty self portraits in his lifetime, and I think Nick, it's incredible. Yeah, he did more than see. he did more than forty. He did about forty paintings, but many, many drawings. Um, and uh, he's probably most famous for his self portraits, uh, which are all over the world. Um, this is a, uh, yeah, this is a uh, one that when he did when he was younger. Um, in the Uffizi, they keep changing this label. It kind of goes from self portrait to a portrait of a young man. But I think it was very, in his early career, he often, the only sitter he has is really himself, and he kind of puts these props, theatrical props on. Uh, to me, this seems to be really his self-portrait, but I think you kind of see how, as the life goes on, life beats him hard in so many different ways. I think it literally shows on his face. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing I will say about his self-portraits is, I think people think that self-portraits maybe are this sort of, um you know uh very vain projects um you know look at me in this sort of vain way rembrandt self-portraits are not vain at all it's much more revealing of his life and you know they're not he's not painting himself i mean some of them he does paint himself in a, in a vain way early on in his career but later on it's just well look at me here i am and you know he was always available to be painted <laughs> all he needed was a mirror and he could paint himself. So I think it was much more just um, a fascinating document of a life. And uh, if you go to the next one, you know, this one is incredible. This is in the Rijksmuseum. I, uh, this was the one that was uh, opposite the uh, Claudius Civilis painting. And uh, so I had Claudius Civilis on one wall and I had the self-portrait as Apostle Paul on the other wall uh, in the Rijksmuseum. And I, I mean, I couldn't have asked for more. Um, and uh, this is one of my favorite. I've actually um, painted a version of this uh, to just to, to understand how he painted. And I can tell you, it's incredibly difficult to to paint even close to Rembrandt. He was, yeah, he was just, I, I think he was the, the greatest painter of all time. If you keep going. This is in Kenwood House. If I could have any painting in the world, it would be either the Apostle Paul painting or this painting on my wall. But if I could have any painting in the world, it would definitely be a self-portrait by Rembrandt. Um, just look at the look. I went to um, uh, an exhibition of Rembrandt's late works in London. 
at the Royal Academy. And uh, this painting was on the wall and it was like Rembrandt was in the room. You walked in, you saw this painting and he was more present than the people in the room. He was there. He had not died. This was painted nearly 400 years ago, 350 years ago. He was still there. It was so present. It was just mind boggling. The, the people that were walking around the museum, it was like they weren't there. It's very, very, very powerful, this painting. Keep going. I think also maybe geometry behind has something to do with it. This is the only time we actually see him with some kind of background that is Yeah, there's lots, of, there's lots of theories about the background. It was um, a sort of uh, a, a, a sort of nod to um, uh, the, the famous um, uh, Italian painter who went to um, the Pope and uh, drew a perfect circle ah, in front Giotto, of the Pope. Giotto. Giotto. So yeah. he went to the Pope to paint a perfect circle in front of um, of the Pope and to prove that he was the greatest painter in the world at the time. And so Rembrandt, it's like Rembrandt saying, oh, I now am the greatest painter in the world at the time. And uh, here's perfect circles behind me. And now here I am. And uh, yeah, this is one of his late, late self portraits. You can see he looks miserable. He doesn't really look like he's having a very good time. And if you go to the next one. I think by now he lost his love of his life. His son died. He lost everything he had. And we can yeah, see it in every he'd brush. Two, he'd lost the two women that he had married and he had lost his son. And uh, he was just living alone. And he'd lost all his money as well. Uh, he was broke. Um, the greatest painter in the world. Um, penniless and had lost all his family. And uh, you can see it in this, in his face. He does not look like he's having a good time. And if you go to the next one, this is the final self-portrait. This was the last self-portrait that he ever painted. If you think of all the self-portraits that he painted, this is the final one before he died. And he died in this year, 1669. Um, yeah. You can see in his face. It has a feeling of a pastel. I know this is oil on canvas, but it has almost like this soft of softness of pastel, doesn't it? Yeah, there's sort of a silvery glow to this painting when you see it in the life. I've been to see it in uh, the Moritz House in The Hague, and it's, uh, yeah, there's a sort of silveriness to this painting, which is um, where well, he just used more white in the colours and uh, less sort of reds and, and things, but there's still earthy tones to it. Um, yeah. yeah. Sad you know, to think that this was the last self-portrait. This was him looking at himself in the mirror, you know, with very little time left. It's uh, sad to think, you know, one of, certainly one of the greatest uh, artists of all time. Interesting at how much he communicates with us, right? It's almost like he's uh, re recording his life, almost like as we maybe write in our own personal diary, he sits in front of the mirror and he is able to kind of look at his face really carefully and maybe go through his emotions as well. Um, unbelievable. You know, Nick, um, I had a chance to see the, the first Rembrandt I ever saw was in Rome. It was an exhibition at the Vatican called Peter is Here. It was all about mm. St. Peter. And as I walked into the room, I saw the crucifixion of St. Peter by Caravaggio, which is a huge altarpiece. Mm -hmm. And then I just turned around behind me and there was a tiny, tiny painting by Rembrandt of St. Peter in a in the prison cell, uh, almost like a miniature, but I had tears in my eyes. It was just mm -hmm. a surprise. To, and I didn't even have to look at the label. I understood this was his work. So you're right. The yeah, presence is uh, undeniable. There's a psychology and a pathos to Rembrandt's paintings that you don't see in on this level in anyone else's work. It's... Um, yeah. There's there's a deep deep psychology of um, in, in these paintings. It's just him sort of staring into himself, looking into people's soul, and, and uh, you can really really see it translated in his paintings and in his art. I think there's also kind of this kind of comfort. You know, he sees us, we see him, and it's like I get you. You know, I know what you're going through. I've been there. I've done that. So yeah, it's not I think too the humanity. deep. It's, like, it's not too deep. It's just this. Look, here I am. Yes. What, what, you know, here I am. You know, and what, no what else judgment, can we do? no judgment whatsoever. No judgment. It's like, you know, and they're not vain. You know, he doesn't look attractive in these paintings. It's not like he's trying to make himself look good 
maybe in some of his earlier paintings, self-portraits he did, but by the end, it's just, it's the, the truth, the honesty, just here I am, look at me. Um, you know, Nick, what else can I, you do? May we all be as honest in our life as Rembrandt is with his own self-portraits. Sure, exactly. So this is you. Here you are. Um, I popped in here. I hope you don't mind. I popped in your contact details uh, for email address and also your uh, your Instagram uh, profile. So if someone wants to follow you, they can kind of see what you're doing, what you're up to. So Nick, I wanted to see how long did it take to do this self-portrait? Oh, this took quite a long time. I battled with this for a long time. The colors Why? weren't right. You know, Titian did that too. Not that I'm comparing myself to Titian, but, you know, sometimes he would leave uh, canvases in his studio for years. Rembrandt did it as well. You know, sometimes with a self-portrait, you're not under the pressures of time and things like that. You can just um, you can just play around with the colours and you can play around with the background and you can play around with the flesh tones and you can play around with the composition of the clothing and things like that because it's a portrait of you. You could take years on it. You could take a day on it. It doesn't matter. And so I messed around with this one for a couple of years. And um, anyway, it is what it is. It came out how it did. I love it. I will stop the screen share just to see if there's any questions from our audience. Nick, we could talk for, for hours. I feel like we only scratched the surface here uh, with these incredible works. Um, let me see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, one of the ladies said more of a more of a grace in the final portrait than the previous ones. Absolutely agree with that. Uh, let me see. Uh, there's a question. I'm curious about the use of solid color backgrounds in Caravaggio's paintings. I remember reading how in the early Renaissance art switched from solid backdrop backdrops to realistic backgrounds meant to ground spiritual scenes in the real world. Does Caravaggio's use of solid backgrounds in some of his paintings have any symbolic meaning akin to the gold leaf backgrounds in the pre-Renaissance works? I think, um, yeah, it's interesting that. I just think um, uh, that uh, Caravaggio, and it's been documented, he was just very obsessed with the with nature. He wanted to paint what he saw. He didn't want to add anything to it. He didn't want to add sort of these pretentious background with gold and gold leaf and things like that he was literally painting what he saw and that's what he you know he famously said that paint nature nature is perfect you don't need anything else um so yeah thank you yes and um i also think for caravaggio the way that he's actually recording what is happening with the fruit every day when he comes to his studio he will add a new new thing to it right so, you know, when yeah. do you stop? Like, when do you know your work is done? Yeah, well, probably when you want to get paid. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, uh, you know, I love to sort of mythologize these artists and think that they were, uh, you know, these visionaries that just lived above the law and didn't need money. But they were just human beings that wanted money like everyone else and they wanted power and they were... They you know, I've got many, many friends that are artists. They're some of the most competitive people I've ever met. Um, they're not sort of these saint-like figures. They are flawed characters trying to express themselves. They need money. They need to party. They need to go out and pay for their, you know, bar tab. Certainly Caravaggio did. Yeah. And so um, I'm, I'm sure, you know, that, that was the pressure of it, you know. He was also on the run and he was, uh, you know, being chased around Europe by very, very uh, dangerous people at the time. So, you know, he, he probably wanted to paint these paintings quite quickly and get paid for them and get out of there. You know, I mean, that's the reality of Caravaggio's life. Fascinating, but he was he lived a very violent, scary life. Nick, how about um, how about you? How how does the process of uh, getting a portrait done by you. How does that work? Um, do people need to actually come and sit in your studio in England? And how long does it take? Tell us a bit about it, about your um, typical commission, let's say. In a perfect world, they would come to my studio and they would sit and they would... Um, For how many uh, hours? I mean, it could be up to, you know, 18 hours, you know, it could be more. I mean, it, de it depends, but... Uh, you know, in this modern age that we live in, when you say to someone, well, could you even sit for four hours? They look at you like you're crazy. I mean, these are people that are, I don't know, you know, they, they, they're, they're working, they have money to buy art. And so they, they're sort of focused on their careers. 
Um, they don't have money to sit and uh, sit for four hours, 12 hours, 15 hours. They just don't have the time. So um, often there's a sort of conversation that starts uh, about, you know, my process and what they're looking for and what they want to have. And, you know, it's an organic sort of um, relationship as it would have been for Titian. He would have had relationships with his patrons. He would have talked about his vision and what they wanted. And they would have sort of come to some organic arrangement and um some sort of final some kind of final pr product i mean um that's the wonderful thing about art is uh you walk in the direction you have this training and this idea and this vision of what you want to express and everyone has a different vision and uh and you just try and walk in that direction and you try and create something and often at the time it doesn't make sense it's only years later when you're looking at your body of work that you've done i mean i look at paintings that i've done 10 years ago and i think oh kind of see what i was trying to do back then uh it makes more sense now 10 years later than it did than it did then um i'm trying to sort of do different things now because obviously as you progress and as you evolve as an artist you are trying to do different things constantly that's the beauty and the magic of art and the, and the magic of being involved in it but um it could be for anything you know someone that's a writer someone that makes cars you know they're not going to design the same car that they did 20 years ago now that they're going to constantly evolve and and use different ideas and um you know that's that's the way it is but um yeah absolutely if you want to uh if you know of anyone that's interested in uh portrait just get in touch and um i'm happy to open up that relationship and discuss anything yes nick i've seen so many of your portraits of your own children actually in the palazzo of your mom uh who was guest in studio twice mimi todd hunter and to see your children now growing up but to have that memory of how they were in a specific time uh, in their life um i think it's very precious and what a beautiful gift uh to leave behind you so mm. nick it was really a pleasure to have you i feel we could probably do this again and just talk about one painting for an hour there will be plenty to to, to talk about um thank you for coming to studiolo and uh, thank, thank you so Thank you so much. And everyone that's watching are on their own journeys in life and with art history. And just it's the most fascinating, rich source of uh, of knowledge in the world. I mean, when I entered when I interviewed Andrew Graham Dixon, you know, he said, you know, the history of art is really the history of humanity. So, you know, just go as deep as you possibly can. Just keep uncovering the layers. It's uh, it's the richest, most wonderful um, journey that anyone can ever go on so I really appreciate all of you tuning in and thank you so much for your time thank you Nick and I also want to extend the, the invitation uh, next week on October 5th I have the pleasure to welcome to Studiolo uh, Venetian historian Matteo Casini and we will talk about a really interesting renaissance topic youth brig brigades and the young men who would belong to a specific group uh, in their own city, so Venice and Florence, and the way we would know uh, who they are, who they, where they belong to, would actually be um, in the fact of how they would be dressed. So they have these very tight um, pants that they would have on. I'm now losing the word for it, but in any case, I will send you all a link uh, to that, uh, my guest coming in next week, and I look forward to seeing you in Studiolo for the 89th edition. Thank you so much for being with us today and I wish you a lovely week. Arrivederci everyone. Thank you. Thank you.